Welcome to another Dr. Sadler's Honest Book Reviews, where I give you unvarnished and critical, but hopefully judicious reads on works in philosophy writ large, which includes ethics, applied ethics, leadership, self-help, personal development, and a lot of other stuff. The book that we're looking at today, Breakfast with Seneca, A Stoic Guide to the Art of Living by David Fiedler, a colleague, and I'd like to think of as a friend, uh, fits very, very solidly into the purview of the series because it is indeed about Stoicism, about Seneca, one of the great Stoic philosophers, and about what we can learn about how to live a better life. So a lot to say about this work. We'll jump right in. We'll begin this review by looking at the three S's, the style of the work, the structure, and kind of a summary of what is going on, what you can expect if you get your hands on this uh, particular book. So the style, uh, Fiddler is a great writer in terms of literary style. This is an eminently readable work. It's very well organized, I would say, too. So it's not just uh, well written and, you know, well thought out in how the different sections and paragraphs come together. But, but it, it's a work that actually is a, a totality. And so it's quite admirable in that respect. Um, the structure of the work is, you know, sort of what you might expect. It's a book that begins with a preface that we're going to look at in just a moment. And then, you know, after a short introduction where we get to learn about Seneca a bit and why the book is focused on him, we have a whole bunch of chapters which are all topically oriented, you could say. And I'm going to read through the listing. Now, I do want to point out that the chapter headings might not give you a complete idea of what is going to be discussed in that chapter, but that's often the case with works like this. So, The Lost Art of Friendship is the first chapter. Uh, second one, Value Your Time, Don't Postpone Living. Third, How to Overcome Worry and Anxiety. Fourth, the problem with anger. Fifth, wherever you go, there you are. You can't escape yourself. Fifth, how to tame adversity. So, so far we've, you know, lots of emotion stuff, life events. And then um, seven is an interesting one. Why you should never complain. <laughs> that will probably be a bit controversial. Uh, eight, the battle against fortune, how to survive poverty and extreme wealth important because Seneca himself was extremely wealthy. Nine, vicious crowds and the ties that bind, looking at our social nature. Ten, how to be authentic and contribute to society. Eleven, living fully regardless of death, and that also looks at old age. Um, Twelve, give grief its due. 13, love and gratitude. And then finally finishing up with chapter 14, freedom, tranquility, and lasting joy, which is, you could say, the, the goal, the end of Stoic philosophy. And then we have a number of other things as well, as you could you know, imagine. There's a bibliography and an index and some uh, further reading, Seneca's philosophical writings, and there's a, a number of end notes as well. But I think that what's kind of nice about this, so there is a uh, fairly short acknowledgments page towards the end, and then we have this as appendix, Stoic Philosophical Exercises. And it's just a few lines about each of these, but I think that can be quite useful for some readers. Um, as a matter of fact, in the acknowledgments, we learn something uh, that uh, Fiddler brought up early on. He calls these fresh translations. And so he says the Stoic philosophical quotations in this book were newly translated by me working in collaboration with Elizabeth Mercier, a Latin and Greek professor at Purdue University. 
Um, we hope that you will enjoy these fresh translations of Seneca and that the access they provide to his still living ideas and arguments. So that, that's quite nice to, to find out, right? Um, there's also going to be a number of illustrations and diagrams in the book I should mention. And what is he doing? E each of the chapters I mentioned is delving into a really important topic, an idea, an issue that Stoic philosophy, and specifically Seneca's Stoic philosophy, is going to help us out with. So what you get in each of the chapters is Fiddler saying, okay, here's a, a life issue that we need to face. Here's what Seneca has to contribute. Here's why it's actually helpful for us. Here's where you might think that he's wrong, but perhaps uh, he isn't wrong about this sort of thing. It also, uh, the book as a whole, provides kind of a overall summary of Seneca's life and that of his uh, correspondence as well. And it gets into some other philosophers here and there. It mentions a bit about Cicero, a bit about uh, Aristotle, a bit about others as well. Um, it's not exclusively Seneca focused. There are a number of other quotes and discussions of other key Stoic authors. Interestingly, at the beginning, Fiddler is going to say, oh, well, these are Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, but we're also going to see Heracles brought up uh, as well as some others. And I should mention that we're going to get some discussions of other uh, philosophers or theorists, thinkers. So we'll get, you know, some discussion of Nietzsche in the Amor Fati section. There's a number of references to Tim Ferriss, to, to other, um, you know, researchers, self-help uh, productivity advisors. And uh, we'll even see a discussion in there about Albert Ellis and rational emotive behavior therapy, which is, you know, coming from, uh, to some degree Stoicism, more Epictetus than Seneca, of course, but certainly relevant. So those are the three S's, the summary of what's going on in this book. It's designed to help you understand Seneca, maybe incorporate some of his insights into your own life, the style, and the overall structure of the work. So what are the key ideas that this book is going to get across to you? I think we can start very early on uh, in this A Life Truly Worth Living section where Fiddler brings up eight core teachings of Roman Stoicism. This is, you know, I think a useful overview. I'm just going to run through these. It'll give you some idea of where he's coming from. First is live in agreement with nature to find happiness. The second, virtue or excellence of one's inner character is the only true good. Third, some things are up to us or entirely under our control, other things are not. Fourth, while we can't control what happens to us in the external world, we can control our inner judgments and how we respond to life's events. Fifth, when something negative happens or we're struck by adversity, we shouldn't be surprised by it, but see it as an opportunity to create a better situation. Six, uh, virtue or possessing an excellent character is its own reward, but it also results in eudaimonia or happiness. This is a state of mental tranquility and inner joy. Seven, real philosophy involves making progress. This is going to be a very important topic. Eight, it's essential that we as individuals should contribute to society. And, you know, is that everything the book is about? No, but that covers a lot of ground. Uh, what is going to be discussed. I think it's quite interesting also in this uh, section that we're going to get this very interesting assertion, which is actually a chapter, topic, subchapter heading, Seneca's world is our world. And Fiddler says, if you read Seneca's writings, one of the most striking things you'll notice is how he seems to be precisely describing our present day world, even though he was writing 2000 years ago. Now, obviously, we're not living in the Roman Empire, you know, in uh, pre-industrial technology or anything like that. But I actually think he's quite right about this. And, you know, that's part of why we go back to ancient philosophy. It's so 
relevant. He, he says a little bit later on, what makes Seneca unique in the Stoic tradition was his deep psychological insight into the human condition, including human ambition and fears. He was the first person in the Western world who deeply explored the psychology of consumerism, right? So uh, quite interesting there. Um, going on, there's a, a, a good discussion in here about something that we could call, using their old parlance, a stoic paradox, the notion that virtue and vice, moral goodness and moral badness, is sort of like an on-off switch. You're either virtuous or you're vicious. That's the stoic official line, you could say. And Seneca himself will embrace that at certain points and also deviate that from that at certain points as well. And this is connected with the idea of the Stoic sage. And one of the problems that comes up with this, well, if that's the case, then how do we actually make any progress away from being vicious towards being virtuous? Because none of us are the sage, right? So this is uh, quite important. And like he's going to say, in my view, Zeno's notion of an extreme dichotomy between a sage and the rest of humanity was not a helpful idea. While well, certainly attention getting, it was harmful to the Stoic school, school, and it brought quite a bit of ridicule on the Stoics from other ancient philosophers. Platonists like you know, Plutarch, for example, Aristotelians like Alexander of Aphrodisias, and, and others as, as well. Um, I, I think that's, that's uh, quite right, and it's an important matter to uh, delve into and to discuss. Um, there's a, a lot of attention being given to the way emotions work. And there's even, you know, an entire chapter, for example, on the problem with anger. Understandable, since Seneca wrote an entire book on anger. And uh, what we find here is a good discussion of the uh, feelings or proto-passions uh, and other emotions, negative and positive that then we feel. And, you know, Fiedler, you could say, is trying to make the same points that Seneca himself is. Um, there's a, a nice discussion a little bit later on about, well, what is virtue? This is a term that we use a lot in uh, not just virtue ethics, but ethics more broadly, but a lot of people are quite confused about what this means. And so he gives you kind of an overview, not just of how the Stoics understood it, but going all the way back to, to Plato and uh, connecting it up with what is actually up to us and what isn't up to us. He says that in Stoic philosophy, these two ideas, that virtue is the only true good and some things are outside our control are like two powerful chemical substances when they are combined and mixed together and an intense reaction occurs and an entirely new way of viewing the world comes into being. So that's, that's uh, quite good as well. Uh, we get an interesting discussion about um, the Stoic idea of following nature and looking at nature as being something rational. This is actually in the section on why you should not complain. Um, so the Stoics thought that nature was actually governed by, infused with this rationality, a logos um, that we can tap into and understand. And he says, because we're rational creatures, we're born with the task of trying to understand the, the world, nature as a whole, along with our own human natures and the relationships that exist between the greater world and our inner selves. We're born to develop our rational capacities, right? And he says, there's nothing unscientific about the Stoic belief in logos, and there's nothing irrational about the Stoic belief in fate either. But, he says, where modern readers end up having trouble, uh, and some modern Stoics, is with providence or pronoia. Um, and he says, you know, it has nothing to do with the Christian idea of providence. It certainly antedates it, right? I mean, it, to say it has nothing to do with it, maybe a little bit too strong of an idea. Christians and Stoics were certainly engaged with each other for a number of centuries. 
uh, before Stoicism disappears as an independent philosophy. Um, so, you know, this is uh, uh, quite a good discussion of that as well. Um, there's an interesting, as we move to the social aspects, an interesting um, assertion that Fiddler is going to make, which I quite like, saying that um, tribalism is really one of our greatest enemies, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that that is quite accurate when it comes to the Stoics. Um, he also asserts that um, uh, natural law and thereby, in some respect, natural rights have their origin in Stoic philosophy, or at least Stoic ideas through Enlightenment thinkers that then are going to be bringing these matters up. And there is a discussion as well, towards the end, about uh, the value of consistency. You know, Seneca has a work on constancy. And maybe this is something that doesn't get quite enough stress in the contemporary literature about Stoicism, that it's very important to have consistency in one's practice without like assuming that one is going to get it right every single time the over and over again doing things seeing whether they jibe with each other whether they map onto each other or, or whether there's as epictetus would put it contradictions or conflicts mache in, in greek right so those are all uh, some key ideas. I will say as well, we mentioned practices a little bit earlier. You're going to find a lot of practices uh, that other Stoic uh, authors do discuss throughout this book, peppered in when it's um, apropos, when it's useful, when it makes sense. So it's not as if Fiddler is starting out saying, okay, here's your 15 or 30 Stoic practices. He, instead, he's going to be like, okay, here's where a more fati could be useful. Here's where, um, you know, um, thinking about bad things that are going to, to happen, premeditatio malorum, it could be useful. Here's what it looks like, right? So those are some of the key features of the book as well. There are a number of good features about this book that I can praise and call your attention to. I'm always happy to do so. Um, I'm going to begin by saying that as a overall work, I think that this would be a great introduction to Seneca. And, you know, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. As somebody who's been studying Seneca for years, and even teaching him in classes, there's a few things here where I was like, oh yeah, that's, that, that makes a lot of sense. This is actually a great way for me to look at it. Thanks, David, for uh, putting that in front of me. So I've learned some things myself in the process of reading this. I think for somebody who has no background or just you know knows that Seneca was somebody important, you would get a lot of good stuff in this um, about what Seneca actually teaches and has to offer you. And the way that Fiddler talks about Seneca, I think perhaps because there's so much personal, you know, background woven into this. Fiddler himself, he calls it breakfast with Seneca because he reads Seneca at breakfast. And he does so because he found that Seneca was actually helpful for him in understanding and living and responding to challenges in his own life, right? So he can, he can lead you along quite well. Uh, Fiddler is a great guide to another great guide, Seneca. And I think that um, <clears throat> it could be like a great threshold. You walk across it and now you're ready to, to read Seneca. And so it could be kind of a companion piece to actually reading Seneca's letters or on anger or on constancy or uh, on the shortness of life or on benefits or many of the other works that Fiddler is going to talk about. Um, there's something else that I, I think I particularly like about this book, and that's liking something about um, Fiddler's presentation of Seneca. So 
you know, philosophers typically will use examples, analogies, and metaphors to get things across, particularly when they are, as Seneca is, writing to other people, whether it's in letters or whether it's, you know, writing a book to them as a guidebook for something. And Seneca does use a lot of all of these examples, analogies, metaphors. Fiddler is good with bringing those up and not just saying, well, here's Seneca's idea and then leaving it there. He explains it. He unpacks it a bit. He tries to make it relevant to our own time. And Fiddler also brings up his own contemporary metaphors and examples. And I, I think that's quite helpful and valuable, you know, especially for a beginner reader who might be like, what in the hell is being talked about here? So that, that's important. Um, I also think that Fiddler has made a deliberate choice. We mentioned that this is, these are new translations. Fiddler has made a deliberate choice to take some of the stoic terminology that even back when they coined it, people are like, what in the hell are you talking about? What does this term mean? And to try to make it a bit more relatable, a bit more contemporary for us. So one prime example of this, instead of talking about preferred indifference, right? Fiddler is going to say, listen, things like wealth or health or good looks, those are not goods as such, but they are advantages. Now, this isn't completely new, right? Other people have translated things that way, but I think that stressing that is quite important. Or talking about feelings as opposed to proto-passions, this very technical term, feelings and emotions, making a, a contrast between them. Now, of course, you know, you can never make everything perfectly clear to everybody because language is ambiguous. But uh, I think this actually is doing the reader some, some benefit, you know, some conferring on them some advantage if we want to use the very terminology. Um, each of the chapter, I would say, gives you enough to understand what Seneca's point of view is, what the Stoic point of view is, and to start putting some of this stuff into practice in your own life. So they're not super long. Um, much more could be said about any of the topics that Fiddler is exploring here. But I think that, and this is tough to do as a writer, this is one of the good points of this work, you know, knowing when to say, all right, that is a sufficient amount. They can go and, and check out Seneca if they want to get more, you know, knowing how to not overwhelm people with things. That's, that's quite good. Um, there's two other things that are towards the end of the book that I particularly like. And so I'm going to call your attention to. So uh, Seneca is one of the Stoics who does, in fact, go against the Stoic, let's again, official uh, line about stuff when it comes to grief. Uh, you know, he writes some letters of consolation. He's got some letters uh, in the moral letters about this. And here's Fiddler's description. Seneca's basic approach to grief is that we should give grief its due. In other words, we should allow our natural tears to flow freely, but never force them and never make our grief appear to be more intense just because we are in the presence of others. Um, and, you know, we can make distinctions between different kinds of tears that he talks about here, tears of shock, uh, tears of, of joy, tears of sadness. Um, and, you know, these are all right. And so he says, Seneca had no problem with grief and falling tears as long as they remain genuine or natural. Um, we should seek some kind of moderation in grief, and it's unnatural for extreme grief to be prolonged for lengthy periods. Very good, right? I think that's, that's perfectly on point. Um, he also talks about Seneca, and this is quite right as well, and I think this is very important to point out. Seneca himself is a... Uh, here we go. He is... Um, because Stoicism is a philosophy and not a religion, it's based on arguments, not beliefs, right? 
Seneca as an independent thinker was sometimes critical of the earlier Stoics. Um, for Seneca, being a philosopher means a person is a critical thinker, not just a believer. Uh, and he says, while very few people have noticed this, Seneca did extend Stoic thought in significant ways. So, you know, this is, I think this is on point. I don't know that very few people have noticed that, but um, it's certainly something that doesn't get enough attention, perhaps. And then finally, there's this great uh, section on um, gratitude and love. So he says, another stoic emotion that's been almost entirely overlooked is the natural feeling of gratitude. Seneca wrote a lengthy book on benefits, which has been called the first and for many centuries, the only great treatise on gratitude in Western thought. Um, so that, that's quite true as well. And so bringing that up, strong point of this book, I think. And gratitude is explored for you know, pages and pages in that chapter. So a lot of good stuff to say about this work. No work tends to be completely perfect, and there's going to be a few things that somebody might find problematic about a book like this. Um, probably the things that I have to point out might be viewed less as really damning criticisms and more as quibbles asking for something that perhaps an editor might have taken out or something like this. Um, and some of them are, you could say, surprises because I, I know having had conversations with him, you know, something about what Fiddler himself knows. And I'm sometimes surprised that it's not in the book. So here they are. Um, the first is that there's a discussion of friendship in here. And, you know, Seneca has a lot to say about friendship. Um, Aristotle gets mentioned and unpacked quite a bit. Somebody who I'm kind of surprised to not see brought up in this because um, Seneca himself talks about him quite a bit. He's not a contemporary, but several generations prior to Seneca who he, uh, Fiddler will talk about later on, Marcus Tullius Cicero, who wrote an entire dialogue on friendship, taking Aristotle's ideas, going much further with them in certain respects, in, in ways that I think the Stoics would be uh, influenced by. So, you know, that's kind of a, a minor thing. Um, I'm not convinced by the argument that is given in there, uh, which, you know, Fiddler is asserting the historical arc of eliminating slavery uh, originated from and was inspired by Stoicism. I mean, there is this notion of natural law. There is a lot of, um, you know, emphasis on our social nature extending to all human beings. Um, Stoics did still, you know, live in a time of slavery. Um, Seneca doesn't advocate, like, freeing all the slaves. He says, treat your slaves as if they were, like, employees or clients or something like that. Um, so I'm a little bit unconvinced about that. And then there's this, you know, sort of genealogy going through Thomas Jefferson and John Locke. And, yeah, I don't, I don't really buy that part myself. But you can certainly say that the Stoics fed into that in certain respects, but I, I don't know that we can say there was that much neo-Stoic or, you know, contemporary modern Stoic influence in the Founding Fathers or other people, you know, um, when it comes to, to slavery. Um, there's an assertion that's made that no Greek Stoics participated in politics. I think on the whole that's right. But I don't think it's completely right. We know that Xenophon, not that Xenophon, Z Zeno was uh, asked to go to the court of the Macedonian king. And instead of going himself, which would have been a certain participation in politics, right, in a monarchy, he sends one of his students. So he's definitely interested in kind of helping out, right? And, you know, we see that Epictetus himself Okay, he's not engaging in politics, but he has advice for people 
who are engaged in politics. For example, you know, calling out um, one of the local officials who got into a tiff with the audience uh, at a theater about which actor to support. And he's like, you need to be a good example. So is that being involved in politics? I guess perhaps, you know, if you want to be very rigorous about it, no. But it's not as if they're not somehow involved in, in politics. Um, the other thing that I find a little bit dubious although it is based on something, it is in the chapter on love and gratitude. And um, Fiddler says, we can all relate to love as an emotion, but the Roman Stoics stressed a specific kind of love, philostorgia. This term could be translated as family love or human affection. This is the kind of love that Stoics applied to humanity as a whole, which is also a form of philanthropy or love for all mankind. Marcus Aurelius mentions this kind of love repeatedly. Um, yes and no. And philanthropy is often philanthropia as a separate, um, maybe synonymous emotion. But in the text, it's not identical to philostorgia. Um, and it's quite, I mean, Seneca isn't talking about that because he's writing in Latin. So it's amor or, you know, other uh, forms uh, of this term, you know, affectio or things like that. I, I don't know. I think that's kind of pushing it a little bit hard, but that might seem quibbling, right? So I don't really have any big criticisms or complaints to make about the work. Uh, that's, the, that's, that's the totality of my gripes and quibbles. So, final thoughts. I am grateful to David Fiddler for sending me a copy of this book when it came out. And uh, I read it in, and have reread it several times since I got it. I've been wanting to do this review for quite a while. I, I without any reservation, recommend this work as a nice companion piece to Seneca's writings. And if you want to get somebody into thinking about Stoicism more broadly or about Seneca specifically, I think this would be a great book for the ordinary, interested, literate person reader. Um, it's written very, very well. Uh, it's What I like about this book is, as I mentioned before, Fiddler is not overwhelming you with too much, but he's giving you lots and lots of, if you want to go further, go check this out. And making a lot of correlations, providing lots of examples, analogies, metaphors. So uh, overall, great work. Check it out. You might be able to get it from your local library or uh, go out and purchase it. And it would make a great gift for other people who you think could benefit from reading this.